Hello, welcome to Historic Tax Credits, how to develop a financial plan for real estate development. My name is Lorraine Minato uh, We are uh, speaking from Honolulu, Hawaii. This is Al Dr. Alan Downer. He is the deputy shippo for Hawaii and I am um, an architect, also historic architect here. And we'd like to present to you uh, this webinar. Here are some learning objectives, how to apply for a historic tax credit, uh, learning about condition assessment for historic structures, and some financial criteria for long-range planning. So this is going to be an hour presentation. Dr. Downer is going to be speaking first, and I'll be speaking second. Aloha. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the historic tax credit, um, just to give you some sort of an overview of it. Um, the tax credit program was established in 1977 by Congress. Uh, I think the first regulations came out in 1978. Um, the regulations, the guidelines have been fairly consistent, but they do evolve uh, over time. So it is important while we're talking about the most current standards today, um, when you get to the point of, of considering a project of your own, you need to make sure that uh, you know, you're working off the most recent stuff. Um, certainly, consult with your state historic preservation office. They're a, they are a real source of assistance on this. I'll also sort of offer up uh, our, our disclaimer here. A lot of this is that we're going to talk a little bit about the tax code. We're going to talk about specifically some things that are really, uh, we're not going to talk specifically, I should say that. Um, we're not going to talk about accounting issues in detail. We're not going to talk about tax issues in detail. Um, frankly, when you get to that point, you're developing a project, you need to you need to go talk to your tax accountant. Um, you need to talk to your accountant generally, um, because a lot of these things, while you can, you, know, you can read the standards, you can read the IRS rules, but unless you happen to be an accountant, um, you know, you're, you're going to, you don't want to be on your own doing this. So I guess, I guess the last comment here is that the the, uh, the tax credit is 20% of the qualifying uh, rehabilitation expenditures. Um, you know, that is that is a very large tax credit. And I, I will say that uh, although Congress and the IRS generally hate uh, tax credits, um, this, has, this has survived several rewrites of the tax code that eliminated many, many tax credits. Um, this one, this one endures. But, um, so you can, you know, this gives you some idea, I think, of the, of the purpose of this, obviously, was to um, to preserve the character of historic uh, downtowns, the, to reuse, adaptively reuse uh, important historic buildings that had uh, fallen out of this, into disuse or which had uh, no longer served their initial purpose. Um, you know, most of the most of the benefits of tax credits are local. Um, you know, they, they go into jobs and ex, you know, purchases in the local community. Um, and then, you know, honestly, as some people, as, as most people realize, doing work on historic buildings it tends to be more labor intensive than than working on more modern buildings. Um, but the end result is. Uh, the, the, the reuse of, of historic assets. And, you know, the, the truth of the matter is the greenest building is the building that already exists. You know, when people look at these calculations, well, you know, we build this brand new building with all of the you know, energy savings and whatnot, you know, 50 years ago, you know, from now, we will have recouped all of the, you know, all of the energy costs in the construction. Well, you know, in a historic building, all those energy costs have already been Um, yeah, I don't know that I want to say a great deal here. Um, the whole purpose of this is to is to reuse historic buildings to you know, to preserve the character of like you know the distinctive character of historic communities. Um, you know, it is jointly administered by the National Park Service and the Internal Revenue Service, our pals at the IRS. Um, it is done in partnership with the State Historic Preservation Offices. The SHPOs 
or an important resource, but it, it is important to remember that at the end of the day, it's the National Park Service and the IRS that's the, the decision maker. Um, so I think that's, yeah. Um, so the historic, the federal tax credit, historic you know, rehabilitation tax credit is available only to buildings that are to commercial buildings. Um, so, you know, people have to be, you know, they have to be able to earn some income or it has to house a business or, or, or something of that nature. Um, qualified, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about this, but what's covered, you know, it's not all of the expenses in, involved in you know, taking a historic building and you know, bringing it back to the point where it can be used for contemporary purposes. But it is, you know, so not all of not all of the expenses involved in that are, are allowable costs for the purposes of the tax credit. They're all business costs. They are they'll all be uh, dealt with as you know, business expenses on the project itself. But they may, or, you know, they they have have to meet certain standards to to qualify as uh, as recoverable costs with the tax credit. Uh, so it has to be a commercial building of some sort. Um, and you know the, whatever the expenses involved have to be, uh, you know, covered or depreciated through straight straight line depreciation. Um, one of the things that I think it should be clear to everybody is that you know all of, you know the, you're dealing with tax credit issues. You're dealing with the financial aspects of rehabilitation. But, you know, you're doing you're talking about design. You're talking about historic preservation. All of those things have to work together. On the financial side, one of the things that the tax credit can do is it can take, you know, if you think of a, a development project as one in which there's a risk and a reward, um, and, you know, just in this slide here illustrates sort of a pure, purely an, as an abstraction, the top line there, um, you know, that the risk above that is, you know, suggests the project in that area is probably too risky for the level of reward. What what, a, what the tax credit can do is shift a project that may be above the line, you know, just sort of as ordinary. We want to go in there and we're going to renovate this building and you know put it back into service. Well, it, it may not be cost effective or it may be too risky. Whereas when you factor in the tax credit, it can push that either closer to the line or below the line so that it, you know, it makes more financial sense to, to go ahead and do that. Um, so there are federal credits, uh, obviously quite applicable to federal, uh, federal income tax. There are also 27 states, I believe, that have state credits. I'm not going to talk about that simply because when we did our tax credit bill here in Hawaii, I looked at most of the other states and um, there's just no way to generalize about the state credits. They are all different. Um, Hawaii, for example, um, you know, we it offer it, it covers both commercial and non-commercial structures, so private private residents could qualify. Um, it's a 30% tax credit. Um, we do use exactly the same forms and the same standards that the Park Service applies, um, but but you know the, the 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 tax structure and the financial structure is different. So, so applying for the tax credit, the first step is you you have to you know the, the Park Service has a form. You can see it, see it here on the screen. This is part one, which is to certify that the project is you know building that uh, is historic, and that can be you know sort of the simple simple way is. It is already listed in the National Register of Historic Places, or it is a contributing building in a historic district. Now, buildings that are that are not in those two categories can still be, um, you know, can still earn the tax credit. However, there's you know the, the process is slightly different, and that's where Part One, the Part One comes in. Is you taking you take a building. And you basically put together a narrative that says, "This is this is why this building is historic, and here are the features that characterize it as a historic building." 
Um, and then you can then proceed as we'll talk about the process a little bit further on uh, into the process, but understand that the building has to be listed um, by the time the project goes back into service. And so that means that, uh, you know, until the keeper of the National Register actually says, yes, this is on the register, the, the developer is at risk. Um, and just because the Park Service and the SHPO agree at this initial stage that they believe a building is eligible, um, that's not sufficient to guarantee, you know, that's no guarantee that the, you will get the tax cut at the end. So there is a little bit more risk involved. There's also more work because somebody's going to have to do the National Register nomination and run it through the process. So part two of the, pro of the application is essentially a description of what the rehabilitation work will consist of. And you know, and there needs to be in there a consideration of how are we going to how are we going to apply the secretary standards for our rehabilitation projects, and you know, to this particular project, what are we actually going to do, and you know, what are the qualifying elements of the project, and then uh, you know, and that that has to be reviewed by the SHPO who looks you know they look at it, apply the standard, and say, yeah, we think it looks good. We think this meets the requirements. If not, the SHPO is, is going to sit down with the applicant and you know talk about, well, could you do this instead of what you're proposing? Because this is, you know, what you're proposing really is, you know, it's problematic and we'd like you to see see an alternative considered here um, that is, you know, fits better with the secretary standards. Um, that then gets sent to the National Park Service. They look at it and you know, go through the same process of saying yes, this 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 project as designed as described here, you know, you know meets the standards, and you know we think this was a qual this is a qualifying project. Um, a couple points here. Um, there is more work to come, and we'll talk about that. But one of the things the Park Service talks about in their rules is that. Uh, you know, each, they view each project as a unique project. And you cannot rely on knowing that a very similar project and a very similar building received approval by the Park Service. You can't rely on that as precedent. They will not, they will not, you know, you a, a, you know you're looking at a building that's right next to a building you just finished. You're going to do the same things. You should not go into it assuming that the Park Service is going to sign off on it the way they did before. Let's see. So, you know, the, the Park Service, uh, the Secretary of Interior has, has standards. Um, and those standards, are, you know, they're, they're, you can find them online, sort of in summary form on the National Park Service website. Um, they are also in regulation. And that's, you know, that's the, the definitive source for information on all I think. Although the Park Service's website summarizes the it, I think almost verbatim. Um, you know, it, if you if you are doing a project, you really need to go to the regulations because the regulations are law, and that is you know that's a 36 CFR, that's Code of Federal Regulations, um, Part 67. So the, you know the the parts the, the secretary standards, you, you know, understand that while. Uh, the standards read as if they're definitive. There is flexibility in how these get applied. So, the first standard is that a building, you know, ideally, is going to be um, put into you know, put in put into a use that has a minimum minimal uh, changes to the character of defining features uh, of the building, to its site and to its environment. So that's particularly uh, important if you're doing a building that's in a historic district. Um, the historic character, that is to say the character defining features of the building are supposed to be retained. Removal of historic materials or alteration of those character defining features is, is to be avoided as far as possible. Each property is to be recognized as a physical record of its time and place. Um, and, and changes that, change, that create a false sense of um, you know, historical identity are just are, are not allowable. So you can't take a project, a building, and say, well, you know, it'd be really pretty if it was, 
you know, if it looked more like this, because that's that's the historic era I really like. That's not acceptable. The standards recognize that the, the buildings change over time, and in some cases, the, you know, the alterations to a building uh, have in and of themselves acquired historical character, and to the extent that that's true, those need to be preserved. Um, distinctive features of the buildings, um, types and you know finishes, types of construction, examples of, of particular craft specializations, um, those need to be preserved. Deterior feature, de deteriorated features are to be repaired rather than replaced where the, re the deterioration is so bad that they can't be. Uh, there's a very strong preference that they be replaced um, with features that match the original design, um, the color, texture, and other qualities of it, and wherever it's possible, <coughs> excuse me, to do so um, using the same, the same uh, materials. Uh, cleaning of, of historic features, um, you know, using physical treatments or chemical treatments are to be avoided. Um, you, know, you don't sand the last brick, for example. Um, and interior alterations um, are a new construction should be done in a manner that doesn't affect, doesn't destroy the historic materials at all, you know, as far as possible. And the work, new work needs to be differentiated from old, um, needs to be compatible in size, massing, and so on. And, uh, you know, part of, the, part of the deal has to be that if those features are removed at some point in the future that uh, it will not affect the historical integrity of the building. So. What's going on? What's going on here? Excuse me. Okay. So um, then the, the final step in the process is you have you've done your project. Now you have to report to the SHPO the park service um, that, you know, here's what we did. Here's, you know, in essence, we said we were going to do a certain thing. We're going to do it a certain way. Here's our documentation to prove we did it. Um, and then, you know, that gets reviewed. Got the SHPO will look at it and say, yep, they did what they said they were going to do. We liked it before. We like it now. Park service will look at it the same way. And then they will certify that the work that was done meets the standards and you know, the qualifying expenditures um, are, you know, can, can be used to claim the tax credit. Do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so talk a little bit about, and this is just a reminder, um, the, the Secretary of Interior's Rehabilitation Standards are to be found in 36 CFR Part 67. As I said, those are those are rules. They are federal regulations. They are the law when it comes to um, you know, what, what standards historic property, historic rehabilitation projects need to, need to uh, <clears throat> excuse me need to be met. So they are you know. Let's look a little bit again. I'll, I'll repeat the disclaimer. We're not accountants. We're not tax experts. Um, when you get to the point of actually thinking seriously about a project like this, you need to make sure that you are involving a, a tax expert. I think on this one we were, uh, we went through the IRS questions and even though they are answered, um, we thought it'd be best to share um, in layman's terms what these explanations really mean. So I think first of all, I, I just along those lines, just as a, a pointer here, um, if you search on the web for uh, you know IRS rehabilitation tax credit or restore tax credit, it will take you to an IRS um, frequently asked questions page. Um, that will give you some idea, you know, particularly if you're an accountant, some of it, some of it's a little bit hard to understand if you're not an accountant. Um, but to begin with, 
So, you know, just to summarize some of this stuff for you, um, rehabilitation credit can be, you know, is, is to be claimed in the year, for, you know, initially for the first year that the building has been in service. The qualified rehabilitation, the rehabilitated building is, you know, a building that, you know, goes back to the part one. It's either a listed building, it's a contributing building in a historic district, or, you know, it was not necessarily um, listed, but did get listed before the building went into service. The taxable year, you know, usually the you're able to claim the rehabilitation tax credit after the building goes into service. So if you complete a project in 2022, um, you know, you would, when you, in 2023, when you file your taxes, when you get your accountant probably for these projects to file your taxes for you, um, you know, that, that would be filed, you know, for the 20, for 2022, and that's the year that you, the first year you could claim the credit. But understand that all of the paperwork's got to be done before you, you know, you've got to have the, the approval from the Park Service on, on, on the uh, Part 3. Okay, so um, the, it's a 20% credit, and it has to do with, the, you know, it, what's eligible for the qualified rehabilitation expenditures. So the, you, you can't take the 20% as a lump sum. It has to be claimed over a five-year period. So it's 4% per year. To qualify as a, a, as a qualified rehabilitation expenditure, so the building has to be substantially rehabilitated. So if you have a historic building and, and all you have to do is paint it to make it look serviceable, that's not going to be substantial. The building is substantially rehabilitated when you've done some, you know, a significant amount of work on it. As far as I can tell, there are no standards. Um, you know, the state of Hawaii has a written standard for what, what is the minimum amount of work that has to be done. Um, and that's against the total value of the of the building <coughs> itself, but you don't you don't find that in in the uh, in the federal the federal guidelines. Um, so the building has to be a certified historic structure. As I said, that's a national register building or a building in a national register district that is a contributing structure. Um, the depreciation of, um, has to be based on the straight line depreciation and it must be a capital expense. Now this is one of those things, this is really an accountant and a, and a tax accountant question. Um, you know, businesses sometimes define certain expenses as capital expenses because they're very large. They may not be capital expenses for the purposes of, of this tax credit and the IRS code. That's really something you need to work with your accountant on. Um, you know, we're not, we're simply not qualified um, to, you know, to comment on that. Okay, this is, you know, building's a building. I don't know, the IRS needs to define this in detail so you can get some information on that here. Um, the rehabilitation period can take as long as it takes. Um, you know, there's, you know, if you have a, a, very, a very large project, <clears throat> it can take a very long time to complete. Sometimes you have, you know, gaps in funding that, you know, those are just, those are the realities and, and that's recognized as part of this. Understanding that according to the Park Service, uh, roughly half of the projects that, that um, you know, have gotten the tax credit are under a million dollars. So, you know, while I think in our mind, a lot of us, certainly I do, think of these as tending to be very large projects, but in fact, um, you know, they, they are not, not necessarily. I have a question. Yeah. Say you start a project, you identify all the work that you want to do, and then you decide to scale back that project. So you've done maybe three out of the 10 points that you wanted to complete. Can you at that point change part two redact some of it and co basically complete the project as such? So if, you're, if you make changes, if you make substantial changes, 
um, to what the, to the nature of the project, you need to go back and amend your part two. And then, you know, it'll be subject to the review and approval of the State Historic Preservation Office and the Park Service. So, you know, in, in theory, I would say there's no reason to say that that can't be done. And I think it, it's going to be partly a matter of scale. So <clears throat> to get to the, you know, the question of the substantial, whether it still is a substantial rehabilitation. So generally, you know, the, the buyer can't, you know, so can a buyer claim the, the credit for a rehabilitation expenditure incurred by the seller? Um, you know, the answer is, is yes, um, but that's, that is, you know, there's some, there are conditions here, obviously. Um, the, the, the portion of the building has to be, that, that is acquired, you know, has to be acquired, has to go into service after the acquisition. So in other words, the rehabilitation project could be ongoing, but it's not necessarily you know, it hasn't received a certificate of occupancy until after the after the sale closes. Oh. Okay. So the credit cannot be claimed by the buyer if they have been, you know, if someone else has claimed it. So if the, the developer has claimed the credit, <coughs> the buyer can't do this, can't also do it. No double dip. Um, and those you can only claim um, expenses that are incurred after the acquisition date. Oh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that a, a seller has done a substantial amount of work on the building. They want to sell, and that's very typical because you do want to make sure the building looks nice before you sell a lot of times. And so they, let's say you've done the restuccoing, you've done repainting, you've done um, all the kinds of interior work, you've rehabbed the paint, um, decorative paint, things like that. You put the building on the market. Uh, that buyer now can get all of the receipts from the contractor that you've paid to the contractor and then use those credit use that amount for tax credit but they still have to go through part one part two and part three how does that work well i think some of that is so certainly um you know if if the developer has not done part one two and, and you know part one and two then somebody's going to have to hurry up and do that um, you know i also think that I mean, I think part of this is this is a question for your tax account, but I also think that that that's got to that how you how the buyer incorporates that into the actual purchase agreement is going to be critical to critical to their ability to make claim there. So somehow or other, they're going to have to be able to claim that they they have in effect paid for those costs. And that's going to have to be, in the, I think, in the, in the, you know, in the purchase agreement. I see. So I, you know, I just added uh, there is throughout the IRS. We've talked a little bit about it here, but in, in the in the frequently asked questions and in the regulations itself, it talks about qualified rehabilitation expenditures, and it's a qualified rehabilitation expenditure if it's something that's in the part two that's been approved and that has you know, has been documented to have been done in part three. So, you know, you don't have to go, there, there are certain kinds of things that you cannot claim. You can't claim, for example, the acquisition cost of the building. Um, you can only claim things, you can only claim upon capital expenditures. I said that already. Uh, you have to be using the, the, uh, the straight line deduction method. And you know, I think that's the basic thing is if it's a building that you know has some tax exempt use, you can't apply the credit to the portion of the building. So you have to you have to parcel out the portion that's used for tax, you know, tax um, exempt purposes would not be such that he's gonna have to figure that out anyway. Um, I think that's it. We thought it would be a good exercise to 
review a an example of a building that um, would go through this tax credit uh, process. Um, this is the Hawaiian Electric Company building in Honolulu. It is a four-story building and it's constructed of reinforced concrete and steel framing. The roof form is a composite of HIP gable and flat with parapet. The hipped gable roof sections are surfaced with straight line barrel mission tile. Um, there's a richness of decorated plaster, sculpture and hand painted ceilings and fine detail of the Chiricura stonework. There's a combination of wrought iron and brass fitting grillwork and gates used throughout the building, which lend a character of refinement to the structure of the building that is not typically seen in commercial architecture. It's a rare and intelligently articulated example of Spanish colonial architecture. Uh, it is, uh, like I said, it's listed as a contributing building in the Capital Historic District in Honolulu, Hawaii. This is the historic district outline, which you can see a little better here in uh, the Google map view. So it's basically this area, this green area here, and the Hiko building is located um, right here. This is the Hiko building. This is the state capital. This is a historic post office. And this is the Iolani Palace right here. And here's another view of it. The state capitol is here. The Hiko building is here. The Iolani Palace, it's right in front here. Um, and um, this is the ocean front, very nearby, as you can see, three blocks away. And just to give you an idea, here are some photos from the historic nomination of the Capitol District buildings. This is the uh, state capital. I guess it's the only capital in our nation that is not of the Greek or Roman, Roman style uh, architecture. It's a modern, very modern building. This is the uh, so, YMCA building. Yep. I don't know why this isn't working. Oops, sorry. Uh, here's the Iolani Palace, which is the only palace in the nation. It's located kitty corner to the Hawaiian Electric building, which is, I think, the reason that why the Hawaiian Electric building is located here is because it was the first electrified building in America, the Iolani Palace. So they needed power. Uh, this is the King Kamehameha statue. And here is the uh, Hawaiian Electric Building, Hiko Building, uh, located uh, nearby in the Capital District. There are many upgrades required of this building. Um, and we will go through these required, required upgrades. First, there's an exterior stucco repair that's required. As you can see in the pictures, there's um, degradation of the stucco over time. There's, a, there's beautiful painted ceilings, both exterior and interior, yet these are these need to be redone completely because they've just been degraded over time. There's terracotta work that is also needs to be refurbished. So there's quite a bit of exterior work that needs to happen. There are window repairs. Um, these uh, windows are steel windows and 
As you can see, there's quite a bit of rot and rust in these windows. The paint is also peeling, so there's quite a bit of hazardous waste material that needs to be abated properly. And there's interior repairs such as the lobby area. You can see that the original tiles are in very poor condition. Those would need to be replaced. And just this is a stairway that's leading up. It's just very, it hasn't been renovated in the last 100 years, I guess, close to 100 years. So all of these need to be um, renovated or rehabilitated. This is the basement view. And there's a lift here um, and that is no longer there. That needs to be included in the rehabilitation, a new lift, repainting, cleaning of the walls, abatement of all these uh, hazardous materials, just the general cleaning of the basement area. A lot of items are still here left in the basement. You can see the uh, fluorescent lights are just exposed. Um, there's some water damage along the basement walls. This is the interior office areas. We have carpet that needs to be removed, ceiling tiles, many, most and of which also are hazardous materials. Um, general look of the interiors have to be refurbished. There's a drop ceiling that needs to be uh, removed. The elevator that you can see here beyond also needs to be rehab rehabilitated. Um, again, the lift needs to be redone. And here are the bathrooms. You see the lead paint all have to be re uh, removed, abated properly. And the uh, utilities of electric uh, and plumbing also have to be redone. Fire sprinklers need to be installed. And uh, uh, wastewater as well as stormwater needs to be analyzed. So looking at, I'm sorry, this is very hard to see, I know, but what we've done is calculated on an Excel spreadsheet all of the hard costs up here and soft costs. So hard costs include the actual capital expenditures for uh, rehabilitation. Um, this includes the sanitary sewer system, the first water distribution, um, 375,000. We have sanitary sewer, lead paint disposal, photovoltaic panels that we'd like to integrate into the roof, uh, HVAC upgrades, which is heating, ventilation, air conditioning. Um, that's Those are needs to be upgraded. Electrical upgrades needs to happen. We have the lobby repairs and bathroom repairs, window replacement, exterior stucco repair, new lift to basement, and elevator motor replacement. Also, there's interior decorative painting that needs to happen. Off-site work includes uh, water distribution, storm drains, sanitary sewer replacement, so there's a uh, total site work and uh, on-site as well as off-site site work costs of $8,800,000. Um, there's some demo costs. Um, then there's interior new construction. We're planning to create li living units on the upper floor. Um, that is estimated to be $100 a square foot for $1.1 million. The, foot, the footprint of the building is about 10,000 square feet. And so uh, each level is uh, about 10,000 square feet. So we have the second and third levels that we would convert to office. And a first floor, which would be retail, that would also be at $100 a square foot. So we're looking at interior modifications of about $3 million dollars for total hard costs of $11 million. Um, now, um, 
we would uh, list these in parts in part two and we believe I guess it still has to be checked but uh, I would say all of these costs would be qualifying expenditures would you agree with that Al? Um, I think I think almost all of them certainly would be uh, you know obviously part of part of that determination is how how the work will actually be conducted mm -hmm. but yeah I, I think certainly all of those costs sound like it the only you know this may be a, this may be something that has to be worked out with the with the park service and with the IRS is that you know they generally frown on doing any anything that's outside the envelope of the building. So if you're having to replace, you know, the sewer lines exterior to the building, there may be a problem there. I, I don't really know the answer to that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Now, as far as soft costs, there's permits, permitting fees, architecture and engineering fees, and then financing fees. Um, now, my understanding is that architecture and engineering fees can be included in the right. oh, in the cost. Yes. Okay. You can also you know you can also include um, interest payments on not 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 acquisition, but if you have you know if you if you presumably you're getting a loan to do this work, the interest costs on that are also allowed. Wow. Okay, that's good to know because we have uh, on 6.5%, uh, we have a 6.5% construction insurance and then we have 8% of construction interest. So that is about a million dollars total of financing costs, uh, including a construction loan origination fee of 1% of the borrowed borrowed amount which is uh, over just over a hundred thousand um, dollars and uh, there are uh, bond financing can bonding also be included in the costs issuing somebody somebody wish it somebody issuing a bond for or you mean for contracting a contractor's bond oh, I I don't know about that. Okay. I don't know about that right off the top of my head. Uh, we also have attorney's fees for the CCNRs and contract review, um, shifty review fees, and other consultant project manager third party review fees for the bank. Are all of those qualifying expenses? I think some of them are. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that they all are. Okay, great. So we have a total soft project cost of $2.6 million, uh, a lot of which would actually be attributed to qualifying costs and a total development project of $14 million. Mm -hmm. We have hard costs of 11 million as well as soft costs of about 3 million. So a total of 14 million. Okay. And I think we're, and I think we're done with right. our presentation. Thank, thanks for bearing with us through this. Thing. Okay, great. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much.